This is James Dean Designs and today we are reviewing the Yora Home Silverback. Hey everyone and welcome to the latest episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel, love laser or CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest tips, tricks, tutorials and reviews. Now in today's episode, we are reviewing the Yora Home Silverback 6060. This is the smaller version of the two options of this. There is also a thousand by thousand version available if you have the space to take it. Now, if you have seen my previous videos, I'm going to get the elephant in the room out of the way straight up front. Yes, this machine looks extremely similar to the Prover XL behind me. In fact, there are a lot of similarities between them. There are some differences which I will talk about later on in the video, but the purpose of this is to review the Silverback, not compare it to the Prover XL behind me. So let's get stuck in with some of the details of this machine. Well, the work area, as it's stated in the name of it, 6060, so we have 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters work area. Now, if you adjust the limit switch brackets on this, you can get a little bit more out of it. So you can cut more like 620 by 620. So it's only an extra two centimeters on each axis, but it can make a big difference depending on what the work type you are doing. Now the Z assembly, the travel on this is 55 millimeters, so 5.5 centimeters. So that means that you can cut pretty deep with this. Now do be careful because on the website, it lists the work area as having 10 centimeters. Now there is a crucial difference here. The gap between the gantry and the bed is 10 centimeters or 100 millimeters, but the actual travel of the Z axis is only 55. So essentially what that means is you can put thicker pieces of material onto this, but you will only be able to machine 55 millimeters into them. So next we'll talk about the footprint. This is essentially the minimum amount of space you will need for this machine. And it is 970 millimeters by 970 millimeters. So that end covers everything from the end of the stepper motors through to the end of the drag chain at its maximum extended distance. Now the height of it is 450 millimeters. Obviously, if you are building an enclosure before this, before it arrives, make sure you add extra allowances around that, at least 100 millimeters all the way around. Now you want to allow a little bit extra as well for the control box on the side. That is around 50 centimeters long by about 240 wide. Now this has got quite a long cable on it, well over a meter. So you can actually put the control box to the left, to the right, above or below the machine. So you don't necessarily need to factor that into the footprint, but you do need to account for it somewhere in your setup. Sticking with the control box for the time being, you can connect a Z probe to this, which comes as part of the kit for the machine. You can also connect a laser, a 33 millimeter diameter laser. A holder comes with the kit to be able to place this into the spindle holder mount. You can also connect a fourth axis to this, essentially a rotary device that will allow it to do cylindrical objects. Now the functions on the control box itself, it has a pause resume button and it also has an emergency stop as well. So you've got a few functions on the front of there that can make life easier and safer when operating this machine. So as well as the Gerbil based control board, the control unit also houses the DM542 stepper drivers, which control the stepper motors on the machine. Now these are pretty powerful stepper motors. They are NEMA 23s and I think they're rated just over three amps. So that gives you sufficient power, not only to drive the 400 watt spindle that comes with the kit, but also anything you may want to upgrade to, such as a Makita or Dewalt router, or a better option, which would be a 1.5 kilowatt air-cooled or water-cooled spindle, which should give you more than enough power for most of the projects you would ever need. The spindle mount that comes with the kit has a 65 millimeter diameter, which means straight away it can take something like the Makita router or the 1.5 kilowatt spindle that I just mentioned. It has an insert for it to allow it to take the 400 watt spindle that comes with the kit itself. So it's very easy to change them out. At the end of the spindle, it is an ER11 collet with a 1 8 insert. Now you can buy bigger inserts for this, such as a 1 quarter inch insert to be able to put bigger bits into the spindle. 
The majority of the framework comes from 2080 aluminium extrusion or C-beam, making it extremely sturdy. Now on this, the C-beams face outwards, which means the uh, lead screws are protected from some of the dust that may be flying about. These are driven by lead screws, as I just mentioned, obviously connected to the stepper motors, giving you good precision and solid, reliable drive to the actual machine. All the cables are contained nicely in drag chains, which are tucked away, obviously behind the axis and then down the side of the Y axis as well. The bed for the machine is 15 millimeters MDF. It has pre-drilled holes with inserts to allow you to attach your clamps and any other devices you might use for holding your material down. Underneath the bed, it is also supported with extrusion to minimize the amount of deflection, obviously because we have quite a long span from the front to the back and side to side of the machine. The package itself arrives in a couple of boxes. Assembly is pretty simple because a lot of the larger components come pre-assembled, making your life very easy. Your average user will probably take something like 40 to 60 minutes to get this built and then maybe a little bit longer just to get your first carb done once connected up to the PC. So for a basic user or somebody getting into CNC, this is a very easy machine to build and get going with. Now to avoid the questions popping up in the comments once this video goes live, the differences between this and the Prover XL, well one I have already covered, the C-beams facing outwards. Now this does give a little bit more protection to the lead screws, but if you are working this in a tighter space or a tighter enclosure, they can be more difficult to access for maintenance. So there are pros and cons to that approach. The other one is the Z assembly. Now on the Prover XL, the entire Z assembly moves up and down. On the Silverback, it is just the Z carriage itself that moves up and down, and this minimizes a little bit of the play that you might actually get in the Z assembly. The other main difference, the extrusion holding the um, two axes together is a little bit thinner on the um, Silverback compared to the Prover XL, but they do put support in for the bed, giving it that more support overall. There is also a slight difference with the carriage wheels. Your home just have two on the top, two on the bottom, whereas the Prover XL has three on the top, three on the bottom. I can't say I've noticed a huge amount of difference in losing the one wheel. Everything still feels fairly stable. So those are the main differences between the two machines. Now, as I say, there are pros and cons to both depending on, on your approach and setup. So it's not necessarily a case of saying one is better than the other. It is what suits your setup the best. I should also point out these dust guards are not standard. I 3D print them to keep the machine clean. There will be a link for them in the description area below if you have a 3D printer. I did a little bit of backlash testing on all three axes to see what type of accuracy we can expect from this machine. And if you're not familiar with back backlash, it is basically when you change direction with the axis, the amount of play it has to pick that directional change up. And with all three axes, it was less than a tenth of a millimeter. In fact, it was only a couple of hundredths of a millimeter on both the Z and the Y. The X axis was about seven or eight hundredths of a millimeter. So that's the kind of precision that you can expect from this machine, which given the size of it, that is really accurate. And because the control board is Gerbil based, it will run with all your common Gerbil based software, such as Easel, Vectric, Carvco, Candle, UGS, and Open Build. So you have a wide variety to choose from. The standard price for this machine is just under $1,600 and it's $2,500 for the bigger version, the 1000 by 1000 There is a discount code in the description area below if you are thinking of buying one, so definitely check that out. Now, regular viewers will know that I've never worked with Yora Home before. This is my first machine. I do have a standard review policy in place on my website at jamesdeandesign.com. Now, I ask all new manufacturers to agree to this before I start reviewing any of their machines. One clause of that is that I have access to their support communities, and I did join the Yora Home Facebook group just to see what level of customer service they offer. Now I should say, they keep their community quite close. They don't let anyone in that doesn't have a Yora Home machine. There are benefits to this. It allows them to give more personalized service to their members. So you can't just jump in there for generic advice. You do have to have a machine first. But what I can confirm is that you will get excellent customer service from them once you do purchase one of their machines. So with all the information out of the way, well, it's about time we did some projects with the silverback. 
So I always start with a 1 8 2 flute upcut bit cutting into plywood. Now this is just generally to test that everything on the machine is working as expected. I also took the opportunity to take a decibel reading whilst the machine was running and this was averaging at 70 decibels. Now an upcut bit in plywood rarely ends well, it does not give a great result. However, I have plenty of spare upcut bits and pieces of offcuts of plywood, so this is the reason I always start here. Now they will cut all different kinds of wood, plywood, softwood and hardwood. Obviously if you are machining through hardwood such as oak, you may need to slow down or take shallower passes. It will also do acrylic as we can clearly see here. Now this is using the same two flute upcut bit, but as we can see it's done a nice job of machining this out of the acrylic and it will also machine your softer metals such as aluminium. Now obviously metal is a much harder substance so you will have to take it shallow shallower and at a slower speed. This is done at a 0.3 millimeter per pass. Now, obviously, if you drop a larger spindle in, you can do this much faster and much deeper. So a bigger spindle obviously will increase your output of the machine itself. So one small criticism of the silverback is that even with the spindle lowered all the way down and the z-axis at the lowest point, with a 1 8 bit it still will not touch the bed so you can't actually cut through any material using a 1 8 bit. Now obviously if you put a larger bit in it will touch the bed, if you added a spoil board to this it would raise it up again allowing you to cut through things. But generally speaking I don't like having to sit the spindle this deep into the holder. It should be slightly higher up to minimise the amount of lateral flex going on within right. it. I then moved on to a project. I headed to Thingiverse, downloaded a file from there. I will put the link to the file in the description area below. I then dropped it into Carveco, did all the relevant tool path work to get the output GRBL files I required to get this cut. I clamped a piece of 8.5mm plywood down to the bed and then used this two flute down cut to machine through this plywood to give nice clean results. Once it was complete I flipped it over, used a multi-tool to cut the tabs and release all of the parts. I then used a flush trim bit on a router in order to remove those tags and give the smooth edges. I applied a black stain to the two centre pieces and also to the wheels to distinguish them from the rest of the plywood. I began assembly and started gluing the pieces together at the same time as 3D printing the axles. Now you can make the axles out of wooden dells as an alternative. Then with a bit of sanding, a little bit of varnish, the 1969 Mustang was complete. And whilst I've never used a fourth axis or rotary device before, I did take the opportunity to do some very basic testing with it and I'm pretty impressed. This is not for everyone, but for those people who want to engrave cylindrical objects, it's a brilliant upgrade that is available for this machine. So for the purpose of this review, I have just focused on the 400 watt spindle because that's what comes with the kit. But the framework and hardware of this machine is much more capable of taking higher powered spindles or routers. So it will progress with you on your journey as you want to upgrade, get jobs done faster and machine deeper through different types of materials. So what do you think? Does this have a place in your workshop? Well, let me know in the comments section down below and any questions you also want to answer I will do my best to get back to everybody as quick as possible. Now, if you are thinking of purchasing one of these, do remember the discount code in the description area again below the video. There is also an affiliate link. It doesn't cost you any extra. I may just get a tiny little bit back, which ultimately helps keep this channel going. That is everything for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. It always helps the channel out. Thank you all very much for watching and final thanks as always goes to my patrons. If you want to get involved for early access to videos, one-on-one -on -one help and even giveaways, then check out the patron link in the description area below. That is everything and I'll see you all on the next episode.